To start today's proceedings, I warmly invite uh, Dr. Vinyare Ratna, President SLMA, to speak a few words on the SLMA commitment towards women's health, especially in these uh, critical times. Thank you, Ashwini. It's my great pleasure to welcome all of you to SLMA today, both uh, uh, those of you who are attending in person and also joining online. So firstly, on behalf of the Sri Lanka Medical Association, I would like to very warmly welcome our, the panel of our distinguished uh, uh, resource persons, um, Dr. Nisha Arunathilaka and Dr. Inoka Vikramasinghe, Dr. Deepa Gunasekara, Dr. Rajika Samanadas, Dr. Pushpa Ranasinghe and Dr. Vindya Vijaywandara. Of course, about the introductions on these uh, experts will be made later. So this year, 2023, the Sri Lanka Medical Association's theme is hu towards human health care, excellence, equity, and community. Now, this whole concept of human health care, health care cannot be without being humane. But we have to remind ourselves because of the challenges and the pressures that the profession is having right now and also the resource constraints that we are having. Sometimes we disregard some of the ethical principles uh, which we need to practice as uh, physicians. So this year we try to focus on excellence both in clinical care and preventive care and also the issue of equity. This year's Women's Health uh, Women's uh, Day theme is of course um, uh, slightly more towards the technology side. Uh, which is innovation uh, and technology for gender equity. Uh, but uh, equity uh, is a much broader concept where we, we really see, uh, even in health outcomes, uh, very big disparities. Uh, gaps in uh, many areas, whether they are uh, based on different uh, geographic areas or socioeconomic strata, but we see striking differences between gender in some of the critical health indicators. Therefore, addressing in, uh, inequities is very uh, of very, uh, it's of prime importance. And also the community, the third theme, that uh, third uh, dimension of our theme, community engagement is very important. So communities are consisted of families. So without families, we can't have, uh, without healthy families, we can't have a healthy community. At the same time, a healthy family always is driven by the commitment of our women. So I think it's very important that we concentrate on women's health and the expert groups that we have uh, uh, established in SLMA also try to bring the best of knowledge in that particular area and also disseminate uh, that knowledge amongst our uh, providers, the medical service providers, as well as the community. So today, I think we are joined by quite a large number uh, online. Uh, and these will be also recorded and then put on our websites and um, mm -hmm. social media so that uh, uh, the deliberations will, uh, will be very useful to be accessed later by the general public and professionals as well. So the um, theme that uh, we have chosen today, I think uh, Professor Anuruddhika uh, Idrisinghe will be elaborating on it. Um, how to empower the family in the current economic crisis in Sri Lanka. Empowering individuals, empowering women uh, is an important part of actually health and well-being of a country. So empowering uh, means really how to make them at the center of decision making in uh, various aspects related to determinants of health. So we have uh, got this pan uh, panel of experts who will speak from different uh, dimensions and then uh, we'll be uh, uh, hopefully, uh, if there are any uh, questions also we'll be able to answer. So let me also thank uh, Professor Edri Singha and the uh, Women's Health uh, Committee uh, of the SLMA for organizing this important seminar. And our commitment is not just only to organize a seminar like this, but on a uh, daily basis, we are engaged in so many activities. All the professional women who are uh, uh, attending this uh, symposium have their own programs, very innovative programs, also following uh, this concept of innovation uh, in the field of empowering women. 
thank you and uh, hope uh, you will all have a very interactive session today and uh, again on behalf of SLMA I wish to welcome all of you to this important symposium. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for those words of direction as well as encouragement. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a very distinguished panel of speakers joining us here today to share their thoughts and their strategies on empowerment, especially of women and of families during these times of crisis. I would like to invite the speakers to take their place on stage. Dr. Nisha Arunatilaka, Dr. Inoka Vikramasinghe, Dr. Deepa Gunasekara, Dr. Rajika Savanadasa, Dr. Pushpa Ranasinghe, and Dr. Vindya Vijay Bandara. Thank you very much for your presence here today. Today's symposium is organized in, in several key themes. Theme number one is economy at home. Theme number two is nutrition at home with a focus on current issues. And theme number three is stress, anxiety, and violence at home. I invite Chairperson Professor Anuruddhi Edirasinghe to introduce the first speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Ashwini. And uh, today's first speaker is uh, Dr. Nisha Arunatilaka. Uh, she is one of the eminent economists in uh, our country, a good researcher. And presently, she holds the post of Director of Research, Institute of Policy Studies of Sri Lanka. Uh, Nisha, while thanking on behalf of the SLMA committee uh, for accepting our invitation, I warmly welcome you to deliver your uh, speech on economy at home, a broader uh, aspect to the present situation. Sorry, I can't. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so I'll be talking about uh, empowering families in crisis, economy at home. As you all very well know that the families were um, it is an understatement to say that affected in multiple ways during the past several e uh, years, especially in the last year, families were affected um, in numerous ways. Their incomes were reduced, their expenditures were increased, and the taxes that they have to pay increased. Moreover, they had to pay more for services that they didn't pay earlier, for example, as you all know, the shortages in the hospitals and um, the schooling, they had to pay things that the government would usually pay because of the budget constraints faced by the government. So if you look at a family, if you look at the um, how families in Sri Lanka earned incomes, major part of it was through wages and salaries. Because of the economic downturn, a lot of families, a uh, lot of uh, jobs were lost. Mm -hmm. And even those who were doing work earned less because the businesses were not doing well. And the agricultural income also went down because of the fertilizer uh, subsidy issue and um, other problems. On top of that, um, and non-agricultural activities, again, because of economic downturn, and the remittances they received were also um, not received as much as before because of the crisis in the country. People were not sending money and the economies abroad were also not doing very well. 
At the same time, the inflation, we know the prices uh, increase so much. This I am showing you, this, the price increases from August 19 to August 22. Um, in a normal basket of uh, food that a normal family would uh, usually buy, things like rice, dal, sugar, the prices of all of these increased. For example, price of rice increased from 18 in, in August 2019 to about uh, 220 in August 22. So the amount of food that they could buy with what they had was less because of this. On top of that, because of the, the dollar crisis, the money people had to pay to buy things like fuel, transport, all of that increased. So how is that affecting the families? So I will be mainly focusing on the poor, but these were also fed by um, uh, families in the middle class and to a certain extent, the rich families also. And on top of that, a lot of the people who were not poor for, fell into the category of poor because of the crisis. So this, um, I'm here showing you the multidimensional poverty indicator. This is a new indicator that the Department of Census and Statistics introduced in 2019. Unfortunately, we don't have information after 2019. They were to do a, a household income and expenditure survey last year, which would have told us about the poverty situation now, but that they couldn't do because also of this crisis. This basically shows the, um, the different, dif uh, uh, different ways the poor families are affected, um, mainly what the factors that are causing their poverty. As you can see, one of the main factors that is causing poverty, so these are for the poor, the deprivations of the poor, is the uh, access to cooking food. So for example, this shows that they are about 14.5% of the poor are using unclean uh, fuel for cooking. So this kind of, uh, I want to mainly focus on the children, multidimensional poverty of children, because um, they are the ones who would feel uh, in the long term the effects of what is happening today. Even within this, um, the two things that, affect, that are affected by a short-term crisis are things like school attendance and nutrition. I want to focus on these two areas because things like drinking water, housing, these things don't change in a short-term crisis like this. It is mainly things like school attendance and nutrition. So if you look at nutrition, there is a new thinking that the environment, food environment that people are living in, that really affects how people buy food and consume food. So the sort of things that are affected, uh, affecting the food environment, are the availability of food, the prices of food, and the types of vendors that are available in the market, and the marketing regulations. For example, if you allow, I know like several decades ago, it was allowed to advertise um, things like tobacco. Uh, so people tended to be, people were um, incited to go and uh, buy, purchase tobacco and things like that. So those, there's regulation has stopped that now, so people don't see that. But you can still see a uh, lot of advertisements about food. So that is also influencing the purchasing power, the things that people purchase. And on the other hand, from a personal point of view, it is the accessibility, affordability, convenience, and desirability. These are the things that are affecting what people buy. So recently, IPS did a study on how this food in our environment, because of the crisis, affected the urban uh, poor. So what we found out is the urban poor, they don't buy in bulk uh, for, uh, for the long duration. They buy what is needed in the short term because um, they don't have a lot of money. So what happened is because of the um, crisis, a lot of small, small shops that were there in the uh, urban poor environments were closed down. So they had to go far to purchase uh, their food. So, and also the transport was expensive. 
So because of that, a lot of the poor didn't actually, um, they skipped on um, important things, especially perishables, like fruits and vegetables. And um, also, they, even if the food was available, it wasn't af affordable for them because of the inflation. And convenience was also a problem because a lot of the little boutiques that were there, uh, you know, the bread, uh, selling bread and roti and these kind of things were not there. And um, to make sure that the children ate, a lot of the older women would skip meals. So what actually we see, actually, that the urban poor, they move from being uh, marginally food insecure, that is not being certain about where to get the food and compromising on quality and variety of food, to becoming, leaning towards becoming moderately food insecure, reducing food quantity and skipping meals. This is a serious concern because that's going to affect nutrition and the well-being of children over a long period of time. If you look at education losses, um, the, the crisis affected, um, it has increased, there is data suggesting that there are a lot of school dropouts that is partly be because you know, a lot of the teaching during the time of the COVID-19 was happening online and the poor didn't have access to um, ICT devices and also internet to access education. So there were learning losses and it was difficult for them to catch up. And then exam delays. I know now recently some people did their A-levels and some of them were 20 years old when they did the A-levels. So, um, which means in the poor families, they can't afford to have children in school until they are so old. So they obviously drop out to help with the family incomes. And um, high cost of transport and poverty, all of this affected the school dropouts and uh, exam failures and learning losses. So in other, I mean, this was not unique for Sri Lanka. In other countries also, these things were happening. And what we see is, you know, the, they, they came up with remedies to help families, things like rescheduling or postponing exams, canceling exams, changing the content so that it was more uh, doable for a lot of the children, and providing assistance, um, catch-up education programs, and um, monitoring and trying to get people back to school. So a lot of these things were done in other countries. So some things that we can learn from here in Sri Lanka. So just, um, I'm almost done, just to some recommendations that you can do in this environment and these type of things that um, are affecting the families, things we can do to try to change. And I talked about the food environment. A Lot of things can be done to improve the food en environment, like even, uh, you know, health ministry can support these kind of things to make sure that the f things like food trucks, you know, like this chun pans going to households, you know, food and vegetable vendors going to these uh, poor settlements. So making food more accessible, the nutritious foods more accessible for them, home gardening in the rural areas, and also um, the school meals program. I mean, I know that was also not happening during the crisis, but that kind of things can also help with improving uh, nutrition. Other things government is already doing is uh, making essential foods uh, available like fries and dal, but the government should also be encouraged to look at making fruits and vegetables uh, available f at affordable prices as all. Well. And also awareness building to um, make use of the available food. I was surprised to find in Nuwaralia, where a lot of the vegetables are being grown, the families don't eat vegetables because they are not used to eating vegetables. So it's awareness programs and teaching um, families to uh, use the available food, nutritious food. I mean, that also can help with improving nutrition in the families. Uh, again, the thing with desirability. You know, you have to come, I mean, the sort of the food that we have, we are eating hasn't changed much over a long period of time because people don't have time to prepare food. So we have to come up with new ways the industry can be um, got involved to do these things, to make uh, eating food easier, nutritious food easier and affordable. Lastly, recommendations about um, dealing with learning losses. 
Um, our government is also already giving social protection to the families, to making it af more affordable to send children to school, but also taking remedial actions to um, change the way we do exams in the short term so that it is um, more accessible for even poor children, and also providing support for catching up on learning losses. And um, other thing, things like monitoring the school dropouts and bringing them back to the schools. Because schooling is important not only for education, but also for health. So I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Nisha. Um, next uh, in line um, to talk with the economy at home, uh, where the title is Prioritizing the Needs uh, Over Wants for Better Health and Wellbeing. Uh, the speaker is Dr. Inoka Vikramasinghe. She is a consultant community physician and head of the strategic information preschool health. She's having a lot of um, uh, areas uh, under her. Uh, uh, head strategic information, preschool health promotion, planning, uh, monitoring and evaluation unit uh, of the Health Promotion Bureau. Over to you, Inoka. Thank you, Prof. Anuruddhi. Good afternoon, and first of all, I would like to thank the Women's Committee of SLMA, Dr. Vinya Ariyaratna and Prof. Anuruddhi for this timely webinar. Um, during this 10 to 15 minutes, I am planning to take the foundation from what Dr. Nisha started with, we are faced with a crisis, but at times of crisis, it's challenging. But crisis times provides us opportunities to empower ourselves as well as our families. So we have enormous amounts of needs as well as wants. So let's empower ourselves to categorize and prioritize our needs over wants. Giving you an overview, now before this crisis also, we had food insecurities as well as problems related to nutrition. Starting from the pregnant women, starting their pregnancies with low BMIs of about 16%. This was pre-crisis. And then we had a low birth weight per 100 live births in government hospitals, that was also about 16%. And from the latest nutrition month indicators, we can very clearly see that under five children's undernutrition levels have increased from 2021 to 2022 drastically. And also we see high levels as much as 10% of severe acute malnutrition and moderate acute malnutrition, as well as stunting of 9%. So we could see that what Dr. Nisha just told us about food insecurity that is seen in the health outcomes of malnutrition. And also, going towards the educational outcomes, the National Youth Survey found that only 40% of the adolescents continue the school. So the education also has been affected. What is the outcome of all that? There is no stable employment because there is no proper education and stable earning capacity is also being impacted, leading to poverty and again, the family disharmony. So this is going on as a vicious cycle unless we take this as an opportunity to break this cycle. You can see that with food insecurity, people tend to use the low cost, cheaply available, unhealthy food. That will lead to one aspect of malnutrition that is poor nutrition or undernutrition. And on the other hand, going into these snacks and unhealthy food leading to overweight and non-communicable diseases. They are also, again, poor productivity, poor job opportunities, and poor income abilities. So it's time that we learn how to manage our money 
and also prioritize our needs over wants. So managing money, one might think that it is saving without eating or drinking, but it is rather balancing the income and our expenses between our financial goals, needs, and wants. If we are to draw the dreams of our life, we all need dreams to live because dreams keep us going. So even at this juncture of our country, we've been through this type of crisis all throughout. We need to have our dream map. We all have our dreams, but it is important that we map the realistic financial goals. So those could be paying loans, education, personal education, as well as children's education. Then we all need a house, maybe some sort of a vehicle, vocational training for employment, recreation, that saving money or prioritizing needs or wants doesn't mean that we are not enjoying. So we need recreation and enjoyment, and also planning for retirement and times of crisis plus illnesses. So we, every individual should have this map in their houses. If we have not drawn it now, it's time that we start drawing this now. Before I go to the prioritization of needs or wants, I would like to just give an overview of, in order to achieve these financial dreams that we just sketched, we all need to follow the principles of cash management. Those are five pillars. First thing is, in order to manage, first we need to know what we have. So that is financial documentation. That is identifying our income boundaries as well as expenditure patterns. Then we need to spend money either correctly, I would rather say wisely. That is where the prioritization and discipline of expenditure comes in. And that is where the prioritization of needs or wants come in. Then thirdly, even though it is put after expenditure, it is saving money correctly. One might think that this is not the time to save, but we still have to save and we will try to see how we can save from some of the expenditure that we do. And fourthly, managing our loans correctly. I would say taking a loan is not a crisis or a crime, but why we take the loan and how we repay the loan has to be thought of before we take a loan uh, and use it. Then fifthly, rather than just complaining, oh, we don't have money, we have to pay taxes, bills, and so on, why not improving the income boundary? So that is also needed in order to generate income from whatever we have. If we look at wants, we are all human, so we all have wants or desires. But what are our essential needs? The food, particularly healthy food, then clothing, medicine, education, shelter. Then comes the comforts and luxuries. So this is the time that we as individuals, as well as families, start this discussion, oh, okay, what are the needs of our family and what are the ways of spending in our family? Because sometimes in a family, there will be only one person who brings in income, but everybody eats and drinks. So everyone is spending money. Therefore, we need to take a family discussion in order to understand, okay, how are we going to balance what we get? First thing is to start writing our income and expenditure. That is cash documentation or financial documentation. I'm sure most of the rich people do this or have their secretaries doing it. So we also better start it right now. I, of course, personally do it, and I know many people do. But if one has not started, this is the time to do that. You can have a diary, or if you're using a laptop, you can have an Excel sheet and divide the page to two columns. On the left-hand side, to write the 
income, all incomes. It could be the salary, it could be from a renting out a house or having a three-wheeler hire, selling something, anything like that. So you write down all your income sources and then you know that is the boundary of your expenditure. So you have to make realistic financial goals looking at your income boundaries. And then on the right hand side, you write all your expenditure. So I suggest that we start it daily, but if you have not started it right now, it's very difficult to do it daily. So then at least recollect what you have uh, spent on the during the last week and start from there onwards. But once you get the hold of, it, of the practice, it will be easier. Then spending money, first we need to think about the healthy nutrition, balanced nutrition for all the members of the family. So when we write the expenditure on food, we have to do it in detail rather than just writing food expenditure. Then only we will see that there are certain desires or wants also within that category. For example, we may be taking snacks. We may be eating a lot of biscuits, sweets, sweetened beverages. So all that come under the food category. Unless you write down all these things as a list, you will not be able to take it as essential or not. So in order to understand this, it's important to write all the expenditure in detail. And also we are fond of buying things when now New Year time is coming up. Sales will come up. So we may be having wardrobes full of clothes or racks full of shoes, bed sheets, linen, everything. But still we would tend to go and buy. But we need to think twice at this juncture whether those are needed for us to live, the whole family members. Are we doing that over nutrition or education of the children? Then particularly in certain families of urban poor, as Dr. Nisha mentioned, I was at the urban health unit previously, most of these urban poor families are impacted by this addictive substance use. So it's important that they write in detail how much they spend on alcohol, smoking, and also betel quid. Then only they would see how much they can divert towards the essential needs of the family. So for example, if a person smokes five cigarettes per day, this was done actually about three months ago, now I think the basic cigarette is about 100 rupees. So if five cigarettes per day, 500 per day, then it's five per month, it's 15,000. One year, 180,000. Amount of money we spend or waste the money that we can buy, the essential food for children. No child should have malnutrition if the, this can be diverted towards the essential needs. Then the second tip is buy more for less money. We, it's, it doesn't mean that, it doesn't say that you, have, you should never go out on a, for a meal. But if you do it frequently, that means you are spending so much. So if you say now for a meal outside, it will be about 4,000 rupees or 5,000 rupees for two people. But with that money, you can buy stuff for the whole family for the whole week or two, two or three days. So for one meal, that is the prioritization of needs over wants, a desire of going out, in, out and eating over getting the nutritional value, food, balanced food at home. Then when we see the sales of clothing, other stuff, we just go and buy. But before buy, we need to think about the value for money. How many times we would use that trouser, sari, or any frock? So the more you use a piece of purchase, that is the value for money that you're spending. So we need to always think, we might think, okay, this is 500 rupees, so that's enough. That is cheap and buy. But you can use it only for one or two months, then again you will have to, rather 
you spend about 2,000 or 2,500 rupees and buy a valuable stuff and use it several times. Ancient times, we used to repair and reuse. So obtain the maximum benefit for value is also another tip for spending money wisely for essential needs. That is, reusing the things that we use rather than buying new stuff all the time. And in Sri Lanka, a study has shown that every day, consumable food, 250 grams of consumable food is being wasted per person. But there are so many people who have reduced the number of meals that they take right now. So we need to think before we cook, are we cooking only for the number of people in the family? And when we are serving ourselves also, are we serving only what is necessary? Then the third principle comes the saving. We have to save before we spend. In order to see this, we need to see our expenditure pattern. That is why we need to document the cash. Once we document, we first allocate the amount for saving, starting from 10% and the final goal of 25% of our income, you must always be concerned that to open an account in a recommended bank by the Central Bank of Sri Lanka. And it's time that we think whether we could save from the essential commodities like food, bills, utility bills, clothes and accessories, and medicines. How do we save on medicines? Prevention is better than cure. So go for healthy diet. Do physical activity, relax your mind. So always take the preventive measures. Then even if there are no medicines, we can be healthy and happy, but that doesn't mean we, shouldn't, we don't need medicine. So we can cut down on that as well. Then the proper management of loans, we must always think why we are taking the loan. Is it for an investment? Do we need that loan? And within our income boundary, can we pay that installment? And finally, we need to certainly invest and generate our income rather than complaining. So we need to think of ways, novel ways, and explore novel ways to generate income. Once you have saved, you need to think about investing more, like in easily in fixed deposits treasury bills, buying lands or gold, and also try to read the rich dad, poor dad story. That will give some more tips. I think that's all I've, I've got to say. Crisis times would certainly give us an opportunity to empower ourselves. So let's learn and then be empowered. Thank you. Thank you, Inuka, for that uh, inspiring um, things you said about manage ourselves. And uh, next theme is addressing nutrition at home. So we have two speakers. I first would like to invite um, Dr. Deepa Gunasekara. She is a senior lecturer at the Department of Biochemistry Faculty of Medicine, University of Kalania, where I'm employed. And uh, uh, Deepa, uh, the podium is over to you. Dr. Vindyari Ratna, President, uh, Sri Lanka Medical Association, Professor Anrudh Dirisingha, Chairperson, Women's Health Committee, and my dear colleagues. And first of all, I would like to thank uh, uh, Dr. Vindyari Ratna and the Professor Vindyari Ratna 
for giving this opportunity to me. And my area is uh, to talk about the nutrition problems in Sri Lanka, the current context. And uh, having listened to the eminent uh, speakers on ecology and uh, the family uh, planning, and sorry, planning in the uh, family expenses, as I would like to bring your attention to this very important area on nutrition. Uh, so how the nutrition uh, is related to this uh, economic problems. So that I would like to show this slide. So how the relationship between the poverty and the nutritional status. So mainly the malnutrition. As you see, the poverty leads to the low food intake and frequent infections and frequent pregnancies, whereas the large families, which lead to the malnutrition of the family members, especially the children. And then these children, in uh, later life, they lost their productivity and their physical status are poor. And at, at the same time, uh, so then when they are getting older, uh, so their uh, outcome is poor, and which can lead to the uh, recycle the poverty and then again due to the malnutrition uh, so then there should be a measure should be taken by the uh, healthcare system to overcome these problems and because of that uh, so that uh, there will be uh, additional uh, expenses which can again lead to the poverty is kind of a cycle and this one is a uh, uh, when there is a problem in the childhood, especially the small children, how it's related to the uh, the elder life as well as, so that's kind of a, a generational relationship uh, between this, uh, the nutritional problems, right? Will you see that uh, uh, the diseases in the, the baby, so which lead to uh, stunting, they, when they have a poor care and the poor feeding facility, and then stunted childs become adolescent with uh, the standard ad adolescent, the problem main problem arise when the male, sorry, female girl is affected. So then, when the female girl, when they become uh, come to the uh, the childbearing age, they are very poor to uh, gain their weight, which can lead to inadequate nutrition to the uh, the fetus, and then it's a uh, the outcome is the preterm baby uh, and low birth weight. So it's, it's kind of a cycle. And again, uh, most of our children are looked after by our elderly uh, generation, the grandparents. And then uh, because of this nutritional problem, and then they are, uh, the grandchildren, uh, the physical ability, as well as the mental capacity uh, will be poor due to the nutritional issues. And again, the caring of the babies will be uh, a problem. And again, it can lead to the uh, problem in the nutritional uh, in the child. Right. And uh, so when you look at the nutrients, we have two main categories, macronutrients and micronutrients. And the macronutrients mainly provide the energy, which always goes with the growth. Uh, then when there is inadequate uh, macronutrients, which uh, lead to the stunting, wasting, and uh, underweight. Right, these main categories, but when the micronutrients, some of the micronutrients shows the direct signs, specific signs. So we call the micronutrient deficiencies like vitamin A, which shows that uh, the problem in the eye, keratomalacia, and so on. Uh, but uh, the the hidden area is this uh, some vitamins. So they lead to uh, micronutrient malnutrition. So they are not shows the specific signs, but they are grow with the, the reduction in growth. It's always affect the growth of the child. So that is much important to consider, right? So, so what are the nutritional problems concern in uh, our country at the moment are protein energy malnutrition, iron deficiency, vitamin A, iodine, and zinc. And um, protein energy malnutrition, so we will see the, in the children as a stunting, uh, wasting, uh, and underweight. And uh, uh, iodine deficiency, I think we have overcome by the supplementation of this iodide salt. I think we are in a good standard at the moment. And uh, 
other than these major concerns there are some other related uh, problems so like low birth weight obesity diabetes and in spite of uh, supply in the folic acid uh, supplementation we still have the congenital malformations and the other problem will be getting with the crisis is a food contamination so then these are the areas we should concern and this is a much so like kind of a very important slide i am showing here i think the previous uh, no car also shown this one there are studies but these studies done by dr renuka jayatis so i have uh, permission from her uh, to use her data in my presentation thank you very much madam i'm hopefully she is joining by the zoom and we'll give some idea at the end and this is showing the trend in undernutrition less than 5 years you will see the underweight and the stunting is drastically reduced over last 40 years but the wasting is the problem it's never change it's still we are having that problem wasting and uh, that category of that uh, the children are not targeted uh, by our interventional programs whatever it is right and this data is parallel with the 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 data from school children and the adolescents and uh, so the wasting is we are in a drastic situation at the moment uh, so these are 20, 2022 data right and the stunting also same the most re recent studies they have done uh, the mri uh, is haven't published yet uh, professor uh, dr renuka jayatin sir will tell us about that later uh, then uh, about the micronutrient deficiencies we can't be happy about the uh the prevalences they have we are with all these uh, strategies what we have uh, taken but still we are in a very poor situation like especially in the iron deficiency anemia in pregnancy uh, it's continue to be problem and uh, and uh, the calcium deficiency is the other uh, important area uh, what we are having at the moment and this shows the trend in the prevalence of anemia it has been uh, the it can see that during last year, few years so it's uh, the prevalence has been decrease but to note that there are certain areas in the country still have very uh, uh, high prevalence of anemia especially in the monaragal polonnaruva those area so then we we have to think about that also uh other than the this iron and uh, all the other important uh, micronutrients are vitamin a zinc iodine vitamin d and calcium is our concern at the moment uh so i don't have much data about this micronutrient prevalences in the country and this one uh, is again from the uh, mri study this shows the micronutrient adequacy in the their diet so that you will see the calcium come to the top is very poor adequate adequate very poor uh, calcium in our diet and uh, similarly vitamin a zinc and folate also in not in a satisfactory level so the problem with this micronutrient deficiency are basically they are prone to get growth failure and they are prone to get infections frequently and uh, low capacity for the work and cognitive capacity also affected some mental issues also will be there and uh, the birth defects will be there like in uh, folate deficiency so these are the problems at the moment and uh, about the food security i think inoka has talked little about even the uh, and isha also talk about this uh, the, what is this food security and we can't be happy about our food security level so we are very insecure and the thing is with the last few years we are increasing our food security insecurity especially in urban and state sector so that is the major concern we have to uh, think and then uh, this is uh, taken from the world world food program and uh, we are the fourth highest food price inflation and the 95th 
five percent of food inflation during uh, September 2022 was maybe much more than uh, that now at the moment. And because of these problems, our one third of the, our population are in food insecure. And as I you know, Inoka said, uh, so there is a food waste stage as well. And there are some coping strategies using by the, the, the society, and uh, it's very dangerous. And 79% uh, are adopting food-based coping strategies, and uh, so more, more people are uh, going for a cheaper and unhealthy alternatives. And uh, about 49 people are uh, reducing their portion size, and 36, 39 uh, percent people are reducing number of meals. Right, so this is uh, very uh, pathetic situation we have at the moment. Right. So, so lastly, so I just the same slide, but you know, showed you. So, I want to show the difference between uh, several months of this dal and samba rice fries. It's a so we don't know how can we afford this uh, kind of food. So the prediction from my uh, slides, so then uh, in future, definitely the malnutrition will be increased. I hope it will be double, some, so unfortunately. And there will be a lot of micronutrient deficiencies, so will be increased drastically. And most vulnerable population are the state sector and the urban areas. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Deepa, for this, uh, your enlightening um, uh, talk about highlighting mainly the um, nutritional issues that are expected to face. And uh, not only highlighting problem, I think we have to uh, find answers. And uh, Dr. Rajika Samanadasa is going to speak to you uh, on a topic uh, which I love a nutritional guide for the whole family during crisis. Rajika is a um, Messi um, uh, holder in community medicine, and uh, she is a medical officer attached to uh, Family Health Bureau. Over to you, Rajika. Thank you, madam. Um, I'd like to make a small correction. I hold an MSc in regenerative medicine from the University of Colombo. And uh, I'd also like to thank uh, the S Dr. Vinyari Ratna and SLMA for giving me the opportunity to address the symposium. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so my topic for today is nutrition for the whole family during times of crisis. <clears throat> so as we all know, adequate nutrition is essential for the development of good health, maintenance of a quality life, and acceleration of national productivity. So the Ministry of Health has actually identified four key areas to combat uh, nutrition vulnerability during these uh, critical times. So one is uh, no, no. The second one is find alternatives. The third is grow, and the fourth is share. So what do we mean by knowing? So people should know what their individual nutritional status is. And also they should have a knowledge about locally available and low cost nutritious food. The third one is economical ways of preparation of meals and also, as the earlier speakers when, um, uh, mentioned, cash management for nutrition security. So what do we need to know about our individual nutritional status? We need to know what our BMI is and what the normal BMI should be, and also what kind of proper dietary practices we should indulge in, and also special attention to be given to children under five pregnant women, and also elders. Now, we should also know about locally available and low-cost nutritious food, which would provide the same nutrient contents as that of high-cost food. Now, how do we prepare meals economically? Um, we can use a different combination, like you can use different combinations of food, like addition of different vegetables, sprats, and rice into one pot. This would um, enable us to save fuel as well as improve bioavailability of nutrients, and also it would increase palatability. Um, now, briefly about cash management, um, we should create awareness on calculating daily or monthly incomes and expenditures, and also prioritizing needs 
and how to fulfill nutritional needs with a low budget and also how to save. Now, how do we find low-cost alternatives? What are low-cost alternatives? Low-cost alternatives are food which will be available in abundance or which can be found in your geographical area, which is readily available and also gives a nutritious meal. <coughs> I'll give a few examples. Um, these are mentioned in the Nutrition Division website. They have a few books which are very useful to find uh, recipes with um, with available food which we don't normally, we are not aware of. So one is Monra Kudumbia curry, uh, the other one is Oludandu Malu or White Lotus Stem Curry and also Kochikola Temperado. These are just a few examples which we may not have thought of before. So how do we mitigate food waste? Now we can mi minimize food waste by, by several methods. One is you can introduce methods of storage or preservation methods like for example, uh, ambutia, or acharu, and also you can utilize food which will be normally thrown away. Um, we may not have thought about it, but we can cook banana peels. Uh, it makes a very tasty curry, and also um, something like vatakolu leli maru, malu, and also we can use uh, certain parts of, or almost all parts of the jackfruit. I'll give you some pictures in the next slide. So you can see lots of um, uh, new recipes uh, which we have never thought about before. So what do you mean by growing? Now growing, um, the minister has recommended home gardening uh, for people. Um, even with the limited space, you can choose plants which are suitable for your area and, your need, and the needs of your family. And also you have to select plants which uh, provide essential micronutrients, for example, gotukola, kangkung, mukunwen, and niviti, which have a um, lot of essential nutrients in them. And also you can utilize underutilized spaces like rooftops and balconies and also discarded metal or plastic containers for home gardening. Then in growing uh, under that theme, uh, raising poultry as well as livestock management and aquaculture is also included. Now, what do we mean by sharing? Now, sharing is uh, sharing of food which is in excess with your friends or neighbors, and also nutritionally vulnerable populations can be targeted through community kitchens. So when you, um, uh, when you want to have a community kitchen, you have to ensure that there is food security also and proper nutrition is provided in these kitchens. And also, if you target school children, through foster schemes or school meal programs, you can provide healthy and dry fruit ration baskets or cash transfer schemes. And also another important factor is establishment of local markets for selling local produce. Uh, now a few take home messages. Diverse diets on different days can produce diverse nutrients. And for a healthy meal, it is recommended that you have whole grain cereals, green leaves, at least two locally available low-cost vegetables and a fruit. So instead of rice or seed, rice can be substituted by jackfruit or breadfruit or manioc. And um, instead of spending a lot of money on big fish, you can eat uh, small fish like salia, hurulla, kuniso, kumbalavo, even a small quantity of that would give a lot of nutrients. Um, I'd like to touch a bit on uh, infant and young child feeding or feeding of children under five during a crisis. So as we know, children under five need only a small quantity of food. And um, we, we, we obviously, all of us know that breast milk is the best milk. So breast milk provides nutrition and immunity. And you have to breastfeed a child exclusively until six months of age, and then age appropriately till two years. So children should be given rice, pulses, fish, sprats, eggs, vegetables, etc., and not junk food or ultra-processed food. So this is my last slide. Um, we have to remember that a uh, lot of people spend a lot of money on formula and other milk foods, canned foods, rusks, sweets, and junk food. So we should try to avoid this. And you can save money and spend money on other nutritious foods. And in order to make a baby's meal more nutritious, we can add a little bit of roasted or powdered sprats or legumes, and obviously we can add some oil, a little bit of oil, coconut oil, gingerly, or coconut milk, 
and eggs even in a small quantity, and green leaves, etc. So I would also like to say that parents should remember to space out meals. Uh, you have to leave a gap of about two to two and a half hours between children's meals so that they become hungry and practice responsive feeding. You have to have positive interactions with your child during a meal and avoid screens. And uh, most importantly, you can synchronize, synchronize babies' meal times with family meals. So thank you. I'd like to end with the quote, adversity is one of life's greatest teachers. Thank you. Thank you, Rajika. And uh, our final thematic area, which is an area which I love most um, as a forensic expert, and it's about stress, anxiety, and violence at home. And Dr. Pushpa Ranasinghe, one of the senior consultants who is, uh, I would say, a champion um, who work for mental health in this country. And uh, Dr. Pushpa Ranasinghe is the senior consultant psychiatrist from the National Institute of Mental Health. And uh, uh, a small note on her, I know she is the um, live wire at Mental Health Hospital who manages the 24-hour uh, hotline where you can call, anybody can call um, if they are in stress. And Pushpa and her team um, manages them. Over to you, Pushpa. Thank you so much, uh, and all others, and who are going to listen to me. And I'll be talking about the stress and uh, anxiety and violence at home, and how it's increased during this uh, our time, and uh, how we have because I've been listening to all the stories of the thousand and thousand of people, and male, female, children, and how much distress they are going through during the last five years. So this is our, these are our statistics. You can uh, see very clearly and how during this crisis time, the number of calls that we received increased, the number of interventions increased. So uh, it's mainly like uh, in 2019 that uh, there was a bomb blast. That the first time we got a number of higher uh, number of calls and then and we had to do the interventions during the next year was 2020 where we had COVID. And you know, that's the time people were so distressed and we were getting more than 4,000 interventions per month. And then it was again after COVID and we had a second wave and you can see that with the second wave, again, we are getting the highest number of calls. The people are in distress and they are calling us. And then, okay, we, after that, we had this Aragale, and that's the time. And people are not calling you in that time, because we, I think all of us so uh, worried that what's happening in the country and watching the TV or in the Aragale. So, but anyway, we received more than 1,500 uh, 1, calls per day, but less compared to the lockdown period. And then again, when we settled with a little, little bit, and then again, the call number increased. And this is about the, the recent year with socioeconomic crisis. We are getting calls about domestic violence, anxiety, and suicidal ideation, and they know what to do. And just they call us and say, this is enough, enough. We don't, we don't want to go anymore. Like, just tell me what to do. Or just tell me a method to end my life. And because I'm fed up, fed up with the situation. So they are, sometimes some people say, I'm stressed, I'm very, I don't, I want to commit suicide, I'm anxious. There are so many things that they are saying.
think sometimes they don't have words just say mata ati vela so that is enough okay that is the first thing we get and then uh, we were talking to them we have about 200 nurses been trained and the doctors are listening to their stories and helping them every day 24/7 and even locked down we were there so i would like to share my experience during that time and just tell a little bit about the stress and violence and how to prevent violence and what we can do my next speaker is vindya will be talking about what are the services available to control this violence stress and the people where they can get help and this is a real time people need help okay what is stress sometime uh it comes everybody say i'm stressed maybe it's a just a event or situation that they find is challenging or they said i'm stressed my headache that they are thinking telling about their whatever their reaction to stress and so about the event situation or the reaction they will be telling you and then and this is a stressor as a reaction stress is a thing that cause that we think this is a physical or psychological social event that we cannot handle this is a stressor and then the stress reaction we know we are wired to do what fight or flight so then our autonomic nervous system get activated when we are stressed and then the endocrine changes and their psychological responses will be there and then stress can make you sick stress can be good in just in the beginning because you know me during exams i was stress and we study well and we prepare well and we find new ways of handling that it's productive when you are little bit of stress but when you when the chronic stress is there so every day that you are being faced with prolonged stress and you don't know you are emotionally intuitive so is spiritual growth will be stopped because you don't have because you are so stressed you don't want to do anything okay and it can lead to depression and physical illness i think that we are in the stage of learned helplessness most of us and because we are going through so many things from the covid to the crisis poor crisis and then now the economic crisis and then we think the situations are coming again and again and it's uncontrollable we won't able to control this and you think there's a we don't have any control in then just sit and wait so apathetic and can our country go forward with that sort of uh, regression no we can't so that's why we have to do something for that because people will come to a stage of learned helplessness learned helplessness is just a, it's not a state actually it is that you are feel that you lose the control but if you use some uh, methods that regain your control and you will be come back to this you will be able to yes i am in mean control that i can change things and our country can go forward i think that's the thing that we need and uh, there are people going to maladaptive coping strategies like they'll be use alcohol and then the, uh, then deliberate self harm they in, try to end their life and their histrionic behavior they shout and you know like in these days that you can't even travel in a bus even at home everybody on pains right they like just i mean uh, what we say in singapore hosalangi mesa and the bear right even a little thing is there just they you blast your mother father and your child everybody why because they are stressed they don't know how to cope with this situation and they become resort into aggression the whole aggression goes in the domestic setting at times we are talking about the domestic setting and when they are so stressed they don't know what to do and they attack they are the the love bonds right maybe the wife or the child they know they are not going to attack you back so you are stressed is going on their their whole mental health that you are controlling their mental health in a way that they are going to be distressed so how we can go forward and we have to understand this mechanisms so when you get stress you know this is stress is a normal part of life but what we think that we cannot control that right we have to understand you got stress the arm stress so what you should do and shouldn't do and things like and you recognize you are 
the source of stress. Why I'm stressed so much? And understand the reason for stress, right? And you take some actions, but you can take to reduce this. Uh, then commit to motivate yourself to maintaining a healthy way of living. I think that she spoke so much, the, sec uh, the second speaker, how to have a healthy way of living, right? Uh, recreation and your, uh, managing your time. And don't ever think negatively. Avoid perfection, perfectionist attitude. You can't be perfect during this time of crisis. And don't take anger personally. And don't criticize unless needed, right? Because everybody under stress, don't criticize them. Please be the tolerant more and more, right? So don't self-medicate the other thing. So if you can't manage your stress, the best thing, uh, there are some tips are uh, there to manage your stress. Get moving, eat, that's what previously told, get a well, well bladder's diet, do your recreational activities, move with your people, loved, uh, the loved ones, and have relationships. Always appreciate what you have and Start from the little what you have and practice deep breathing and write daily positive affirmation on the in post, right? Then in the Facebook what you are going to write, not about the crisis, but write about the post, the hope. That's the only thing that we are left with. And read it yourself at least twice a day. And make time for relaxation, listen to music, meditation, and always surround with the people who are really, really care for you and not criticizing you, who's uplifting your mental health. So always be with them, identify them, be with them, and for the time being, don't take other people's stressors onto your head. So some people, I mean, you know, like in your even at home, that hey, there's a problem there. Even you have a family member who's always complaining. If you can't tolerate, please be away from that person for a while and give breaks at times. So there will be worrying time at home. Only that time they can tell about the worries. Okay, not the whole day, 24-7. So make that way. So if you can manage stress even with this, and you can go to a therapist, a psychiatrist, or a counselor, and get more help. So, so the next one is anxiety. Stress is the everyday thing that we get. Anxiety is that you are excessively worry or anticipation of about a stress. It's beyond like anxious when there's no threat at all. Or your anxiety response is out of proportion to the threat. So too much of response, always your own pains. Like when you are stressed, maybe just before the exam, you are a bit stressed, okay, that is stress. But anxiety is you're always anticipating, oh my God, I have to do this tomorrow. Oh my God, I have to do this. Oh my, I won't go to pass. Oh my God, I have to do this. Always your own pains. And see, that is generalized anxiety you are going to get. So you can't do anything because you are anxious. That is a pathological uh, state. So you'll be racing hard, chest discomfort, trembling dizziness, muscle tension, and your headache, sweating, shortness of breath, you don't know what to do. So I'll give you three tips and what is this anxiety and how we can control it with just three steps. And one thing is, just think about it. The scientific three, this is a, just a physical reaction. Okay, this my sympathetic system has got activated. That's why I'm sweating and I'm fearful, I'm doing this. And labor this anxiety. And then the catastrophe thinking, oh my God, I'm going to faint, or it's everything I'm going to lose. That is the problem in anxiety. But, so it goes as a cycle like this. Perceived threat, apprehension, then the body sensation, you are getting sweating and all this heart pounding, and then, oh my God, then you are thinking there's a catastrophic event. But all these things are in your brain. Right? It's in your brain. You can change it. Because you are the creator of your thought. If you are the creator of your thought, you can change the thought and change your body symptoms. So, in three steps, how we are going to control your anxiety? It's the step one, the control breathing, the deep breathing. What you'll do, because you are sympathetic system activated, when you're doing the deep control breathing, that your respiratory rate goes down. When the respiratory rate goes down, and it will inform the brain, there is no urgency. It's, that person is breathing so slowly. And the brain thinks, no, there is no, nothing to be worried about. So that the thought generates there. 
because now we are sensation creating the thought right and the previous thought is wrong and then what happened then your para parasympathetic system get activated you are much more relaxed step to rename anxiety as i'm excited yes to give this lecture you are excited that's why i'm getting my uh, sympathetic system activated i'm not stressed i'm not anxious just my i'm excited you are relabeling it and once you said you are excited you are anxiety when you are using the word anxiety you are worried but when you are using the word excited you will be happy yeah i am excited to say right so in the same way then step 3 bring down the not overestimating the risk always we are always oh my god everything is over oh my god the catastrophic event no it's not that we we also had that no? oh my god now we are not going to have petrol anymore oh my god we will have to walk to walk we have to <laughs> walk up to the, my station right we thought so not like that no by the um, during that time we thought we are going to be like but we are overestimating the risk we did happen we said we won't have food i don't know what to do we are not going to have medication everybody going to die because we are overestimating the risk but you are underestimating your power to control it yes we can get some loans and we can get from imf and we can increase our uh, income and we can decrease our expenditure that is you are under control so you are not thinking about it so change your thinking pattern right so with this three step you are going to be much stable if you cannot control with this please go to a psychiatrist or a counselor especially a psychiatrist then they will decrease your anxiety very quickly with medication and give you tips the psychological therapies for you to have a better life then with this all these things we are having a domestic violence right because people are stressed i told you they are every pair that they don't know how to get this stress out and they'll be hitting their wife or children or whatever the domestic violence there are different types physical violence sexual violence emotional abuse and just economic abuse as well as the psychological abuse so the violence cycle also the person who never scolded at your husband who never said something and now always whatever you do and he is criticizing it he is always aggressive so whatever you say that he is telling you something okay and try to hit you at times maybe that he might hit you so that is the violence start but what you have to say zero tolerance to violence once you start that violence it will increase stop that violence that time you have to do some intervention otherwise what happened once the violence happened then they will come and say oh i am sorry i will never do this this is the first time i did it i never do that i promise you um this is here like that so they will i'll just worship you and ask for the forgiveness then what happened then he brings flowers and they start the honeymoon period and you are so happy and going up and down and you oh my god my husband just asked me forgiveness oh my god huh? i'm how lucky i am you think like that but if you don't do any intervention at that moment then then again with time again that the violence is going to come so this time the violence time period will be very short before he used to scold once a week then it become once in 3 days then it become daily and then it will increase up to maybe ver- verbal violence going to physical violence and it will increase so never never believe that i am never going to do it again that word you have to do intervention you have to go to a therapist or do something to stop that zero tolerance to violence and so if you continue that the it will be if you just say that okay come up ne it's okay what to do he is so so stressed no but when you are internalizing it then you will become so depressed and you become a compromised ability to the survivor to 
care for her children because you are depressed you won't be able then there will be child malnutrition because you are not able to have this creative way to do things and you don't have any interest in that and then you won't be able to go to work or do anything once you are very depressed and then we can have suicidal ideation or deliberate self harm will end up with and this life is enough right so i'm just telling don't uh, how can you when they are suicidal how to, don't try to judge them and talk to the person about how they feel encourage him to get help ask them to how they they can get help and help them to stay safe if it is if it is really dangerous get them out of that dangerous situation and look out for the warning sign so my next speaker vindya will talk about how to do those things how to assess the woman through the grief work how to have a safety plan and what are the information about the resources and how to enhance the person's assertiveness and how to assess the woman in decision making process and how to survive and what are the places available thank you thank you so much for listening to me thank you pushpa that uh, uh, lovely insight uh, to the culmination of events and uh, and uh, i think the next speaker uh, dr vindya would uh, give us more information and also where to go and uh, dr vindya uh, vijay pandare is a consultant psychiatrist in the provincial general hospital ratnapura and uh, she has come all the way from ratnapura to slma today and thank you vinda and we are hoping to enlighten all of us the people who are here as well as i know in the zoom want the answers or how to get help over to you vinda thank you ma'am good afternoon to you all of you first of all thank you so much getting us psychiatrists involved in such a symposium uh, actually to begin with uh, we have been working many decades especially mental health related to children women adults teenagers but we hardly get the opportunity to represent the i mean not the depth of the work at least to show a glimpse of work we had been doing so st stepping after my mentor madam pushparan singh i got the privilege to get an insight into this beautiful area where rather of even the doctors or the medical field people have given a blind eye so to begin with the problems are they are existing the problem is they are so complicated so that the dimension the impact the area wise there are many to think over so definitely the measures go should should go in line in line so it should be multi dimensional involving many stakeholders how can we help so since is the so many dimensions to begin with there will be psychological things we need to do then the, there will be medical where the medications or the other interventional things uh, has to be included then there will be social financial legal and i included religious as well taking into consideration what we do to begin with first step is early identification why i have included in this year the main concern is although it's there we don't know it's there so raising awareness is a key and it, actually the lack of awareness is at many levels to begin with the individual so the person per se doesn't know i'm under stress so i'm anxious i'm worried or i'm depressed or oh, i'm a victim of domestic violence then at times unfortunately the health care level we people are unaware a woman persons with such a injury 
is not given due attention so that the, the significant or the most important things are being rather neglected. And then the society. Is our community is sensitive enough for the violence? So taking my area where I work, hardly the neighbors pay attention. The next door neighbors, it's not my business. So yes, the community is not properly aware of. And unfortunately, I have included the different ministries as well. It's not only health. Sometimes the different ministries, the legal system, are they, are they clearly aware of the gravity? Or the social services department, the probation, are, are we all aware of the depths and the extremes? Maybe we are aware, but what we do is we just ignore. Over look at What are the gahanna hodana? Over later. For example, if a case such a case comes, my gosh, you can't finish in five to ten minutes. It will go even up to one hour. And Madam knows sometimes it, we don't have finishing time. Until we draw up a clear management plan and the measures are taken, it will drag on. So no finishing times. So people at home are well aware. There's no time of coming back. We can't really say we are coming back at like six so. It's not like that. If a case such a case comes, case comes, so the the whole team has to be committed and set out a plan. So I'll begin with what me, represent the Ministry of Health, can offer for the draw the dramatic outcomes, psychosocial bad effects of uh, the financial crisis. To begin with, we have. Consultant psychiatrists led multidisciplinary teams. Actually, there were consultants up to the base hospital level. The financial crisis itself paid way to a significant loss. I don't know the exact number. We are the, even the college is trying to sum up the numbers and see what's going to happen. So, hopefully, neither better. We, by the end of this year, we can give a clear cut. But remember. Mm -hmm. Each district is blessed with at least five to six consultant psychiatrists. Even one is missing, we are covering up the nearby. So for now, uh, Ratnapura, myself, we were covering three hospitals, and one of the SRs took over one hospital. So yes, we covering up. There are three consultant psychiatrists at, attached to teaching hospital Ratnapura, yes. There are people still, people are not going. So there are consultant psychiatrists led multidisciplinary teams. Apart from the consultants, there are diploma holders where they run clinics up to the district hospital level. Even the, the, the smallest dispensaries, we do outreach clinics. So we have spread our wings. Apart from these psychiatric teams, we have Mitru PSA, which is led by the Family Health Bureau, Many years it had been functioning, and by now, more than 50. So at least two to three per district, we are functioning with Rupiahs. Why I say with Rupiahs we are functioning? Because we, the psychiatric team, always had give up the hand to the functioning. Some of the units are directly run by the mental health clinic, uh, or one of the team members, we always extend our support. There is no waiting time, no appointment driven. Walk in, step in, we help. And then the last addition we have included under the Ministry of Health is 1926 Mental Health Helpline in 2018. And the last one I have listed out is we go hand in hand with especially the mental maternal health network. If I want to elaborate on the multidisciplinary team, there are docs, doctors, nurses, and supportive staff who are trained for psychiatry work. Uh, and then apart from them, we have community psychiatric nurses. So there is a nurse who is trained for one year uh, theoretical and practical knowledge to work in the community. So they can do home visits, field visits, and in the field, 
going with the psychiatrist or the doctor, they can do assessment at the community, at your home, at your field, or at your working place. We can do the assessments. At the same time, we can administer medication as well. So we do field visits, home visits, and we administration depot injections, and we are blessed with psychiatric social workers as well. So they do the social work part, especially in psychiatry, we do the liaison part. So we liaise, we bring down the network, join hand with others. So the psychiatric social worker is the networker. So he, he or she joins us with the medi other medical specialties, the social specialties. So we have a safety network. We are to refer what to do and whom to contact. The social workers always are very handy. Then the rehabilitation, the occupational therapies, they help us in the, the there will be functional issues, there will be vocational issues, occupational issues. So the occupational therapies, yes, they help us. And some of the hospitals, we have counselors. Under the government uh, job opportunities, many, many dog, uh, degree holders got the job. So we volunteer ourselves, get them trained to do counseling, so they are also in our team. So the teams, of course, there are many things we can do, many wonders you can do if your head or the mind is good. So if you're, men if you're mentally little down, for example, if there is significant anxiety or it's amounting to depression or suicidality, yes, you need medication. The pharmacological medications under the Ministry of Health. We are blessed to have a couple of antidepressants, a couple of antipsychotics. Yes, there are excess and less in certain areas, but we can go by basics. So basics do help us. So if you pay a visit to a mental health clinic, we can offer pharmacological support. Even, even at the GP level, we encourage primary health care doctors to treat depression and suicide. Why not? You start the medication and send to us for a referral. We'll draw up the plan and you continue. We'll always support you and assist your management. The psychological, yes, to begin with basic counseling. Apart from that, we offer do offer therapies as well. So, there are, unfortunately, we don't have, uh, I mean, there are no clinical psychologists under the Ministry of Health, but don't worry, we are there. We'll help offer the basic therapies, starting from debriefing, ventilating out, and go up to even cognitive behavior therapy. Yes, depending on the cases, some of the units we have group therapy as well. So it's maybe not the psychiatrist per se led the therapy session. Yes, there'll be doctors, there'll be social workers, and especially these multidisciplinary teams, some of them hold a diploma in counseling as well. So they are their sets. So they will continue the psychological therapy, which we will be starting. The social network, legal network, yes. Of course, the, when the issues amount to violence, we need these, as, these aspects. Significantly traumatized individuals come with more than medical or the psychological issues, they, are, they lack the social support. They lack the legal awareness. So maybe it's not us who give the in information. We can liaise with the, the legal teams in your local area. Yes, um, MDT teams will definitely give the insight into each area. Sometimes they come with injuries, never being looked in properly we can get the other medical and the surgical experts to look into. And in the long run, some of them will need rehabilitation. So yes, our teams can give an assistance. I have included educational with blonde font, with big fonts. Nothing comes prior, nothing gives priority without we setting up a step ahead and informing couple more. So each case gives us a strength or gives opens a way, a new way, so that 
each case, each individual you see, you can give a hope by educating what is wrong, what shouldn't be done, and help and show them there is help, there is hope, and they can come out. Nitrupia sir, I said two to three per district functioning. Yes, they had been functioning very well with enough statistics and they go hand in hand with us, the psychiatric teams. At the same time, I, I'll be telling about the police as well. So the regional legal, the medical legal liaison part would be done definitely to the Mitru PSA. So feel free, it's, it's destigmatizing as well. It's a, just a counseling unit, a Mitru friendly unit. Just pay a walk-in. Even a single just for observation walk-in is encouraged these days. I'll be blamed by the teams, but I would say just pay a visit. And since 2018, along with the Mental Health Day in October, we opened 1926, our National Mental Health Helpline. And why we opened this is to increase accessibility. Accessibility for what? Information and direction. So that was our motto in opening this mental health helpline. So please do dial in any phone. We have the WhatsApp number as well. So seeking for help will pay an encouragement not only to yourself, to your family, and in whole, the community as well. I wouldn't go into statistics, Madam showed this slide, but I included this is, it is going regional now. It's not, it was centered to NIMH, Angoda, National Institute of Mental Health, Angoda, but we are going regional now. Even at Ratnapura, we have a functioning line. Thanks to Madam's vision and uh, dedication, we had been maintaining, and the caseloads we cover is a lot. And thanks to the line, we have saved the reasonable number of lives, and we are yet to save more. The training is continuous. Yes, you can refer. And we don't work in isolation. We always appreciate the other people who are working. The Women and Child Affairs Ministry, yes, they have the 1938 helpline. If they have issues, of course, they will refer to the local mental health team. And 1929, the the line relevant to the children. What about if there is substance? Madam mentioned, yes, it's a maladaptive thing. Even in every psychiatric clinic, we have a specialized clinic for rehabilitation or some uh, substance-related clinic. So please do refer. If the individual is not coming, why don't you come in and talk to us? We'll formulate a network or a plan what to do and how to work it out. So if you need anything relevant to the drug rehabilitation or work, 1927 is run by the National Dangerous Drug Growth Control Board. So you can give a ring to them. And this is 1984 run by in line with the NDCC and the police. This is for information on availability. Yes, you can give a tip off. Other government stakeholders. Now, why I included this is it's not only medical staff who see the cases or the individuals as first sight. These people with so many worries walk into the DS office, district secretarial office, AG office in other terms. And they will maybe go and walk into the social services department. Or if they have issues, they will end up with the probation officer. So these stakeholders also are playing a very important role. So at Ratnapura, always when they, they get an issue or concern, they give us a ring. Maybe not me, but my team member, either psychiatric social worker or my community psychiatric nurse, and we get them down and work it out. For example, just last week, a mother of two, both children under five, neglected by the husband. She has lost the job. No one is supporting at the same time. Her own elder brother, who is uh, having a little bit of issue, or I would say not a little bit, a significant issue with substance, has attempted uh, sexual assaulting 
I mean, for example, his own sister. So they, uh, this lady, the next day, end up hold, leaving one child at home, who is just five years alone, came to the social services uh, department office at Ratnapura with the two-year-old child and has threatened, unless you give me shelter, I'm going to commit suicide inside the office. So they rang me and asked for help. So in such case scenarios, what we did is quick action. Get them down for a safety shelter. That's the only safety shelter at that moment is getting them to the psychiatric clinic, not to the ward, psychiatric clinic. So I offered her space and uh, let her time to ventilate out. So after a deliberate, I, after taking a long time and offering her space and time, we gathered a lot of social information so that within few hours we could contact or even up to the ground service level, the regional authorities and ensure a safety network. And mother, two children were resettled to a distant relative who is relatively far away. And in the long run, we'll be looking into the uh, mother's employment, yes, the little one is two years of age, so we'll have to look into the self-employment part. Until such, we were able to uh, assist financially, yes. There were depressive issues, depressive symptoms, but that were not amounting to the medication level, yes. So we didn't offer medication, but psychological support, social support, and we offered them the legal support, lasting with the local police as well, so yes. The network can be laid down, a safety network can be laid down with liaising all of them. And I got down the probation officer as well. There's two young children at home and one five-year-old left at home alone. So got down the probation officer as well. And these ladies, you know, they are also like workaholic. The only thing what I see is we are not interconnected. So let us all get together and bring a network so that the plan becomes workable. Of course, need to mention Sri Lankan police, there are very warm-hearted ladies working there as well as gentlemen, yes. You have to touch their soft corners and get them involved into your work. They will always offer help. The non-governmental organization, they awfully neglect as money-minded. Of course, WIN has been, the women in need has been helping us, yes. There are many, many people not only in locality in my area, yes, certain uh, the organization need not mention, they come and ask, I mean, we, they can offer help. Especially why I need mention women in need is they offer temporary shelter. So for that mother and two children, if there is no place to send, for example, I would have offered space, one bed in my acute ward. Why not? We are there to offer the needy. So, yes. Even in ward setting, if they, we don't have psychiatric ward, of course, the medical wards, the gynae ops people, they always, even the pediatric teams, yes, we involve them for temporary shelter. Acutely, if there's no one to look after, we will not send them to a very dangerous place, of course, take, give temporary shelter and do the need work. So, to sum up, let me start with few facts, few tips. If you be aware, yes, there are things like this. You have to be alert. Because every case, there will be issues. So let's detect early. If you detect early, do the risk assessment. The risk assessment begins with risk to self, yourself, then to the family. If there are children, very, very significant, yes. If there are threats or, I mean, if there are a perpetrator or the, the one who caused pain is inside the family, a family member, whether there is homicidal risk to that individual as well. And then, if there is risk to the society as a group, or then, if this is an eminent person, is there a social risk or is there a problem with this say, dignity? Yes, the social risk. And then, if there are risk to any individual or any anyone around or self, others, community, yes, if it's very high, you can't can't keep quiet. You need to refer. 
maybe if, if I can't handle, I definitely I'll ring madam or the uh, nearby hospital or nearby shelter. Bay. Refer. Don't handle it yourself. Get us included. Counseling, yes, almost, almost, always. We can't neglect. And yes, we need social and legal support. So let's get the other people involved as well. So it's not single hand job. Let us join our hands together for a better future. Thank you. Thank you, India. That uh, super bending. I think um, this issue, our today's um, theme, uh, empowering uh, the family in critical times without everybody's um, get togetherness, taking networks, referring, we can't address the issue. So now I open the. Um, Anybody who is uh, there in the audience or in the Zoom, uh, if you have any questions to uh, individually for the uh, speakers here, we have six speakers here, uh, you can direct the questions now. The uh, forum is open for questions. Country is again the tensions are uh, seems to be building again. Uh, as an economist, um, that they are now talking about this uh, uh, help from uh, from the uh, IM, IMF. Um, are you all realistically that that help will it come to the family, which we are uh, finding? issues. we have some hope uh, from the uh, from the economist point of view um, I think I have uh, my favorite area of mental health are you all prepared uh, Pushpa uh, now you, you showed the um, 
the, the tensions are building. Help is coming. But in the meantime, what is expected? Are you all the, the uh, Ministry of Health and we doctors, plus the networks, are they committed enough to um, address the issues? Actually, we are prepared. I mean, from the time of uh, COVID, that we uh, start increase our training levels about nurses, increase that uh, about increasing their awareness about mental health and the importance of mental well-being, and not only to that. So now our centers also been now decentralized to all 25 districts, and we have trained more than uh, about almost 250. Uh, volunteers in the, all the districts. So each district has a unit. And our unit also, now we have so many uh, nurses being 200 nurses being trained. So further uh, networking being done. And we are going to do further training as been we are getting uh, help from a Asia Foundation as well as uh, other College of Psychiatrists arranging things that we are increasing our training as well as uh, increasing the service delivery. And uh, also that we are going to get more of a com community participation. And we are going to train volunteers, young volunteers. And I think the uh, training young volunteers not only getting uh, their mental health up as well, and they change their attitudes. And then they will, uh, in a way that they help each other. And uh, we all have one common goal, getting this country forward and maintaining our mental well-being and up to the maximum. And we spread out all the training and awareness to the ground level. So I think that we are doing our work. Right. Thank you, Pushpa. I think uh, uh, the time is on. So uh, yes, Sampata, you, um, you have a question. Um, yeah, first to the panel, I mean, it was really interesting and all six of you all spoke very well and very important topics were covered. Uh, I have a question for Inoka. Inoka, you, uh, no, the, you were, I mean, very simply, you, um, you spoke about uh, what to do and how to ex uh, think about the needs and the desires and how to prioritize everything. So, I mean, have we also educated this, given this knowledge to the common persons in the, in the community. Uh, that is what I want to know, because like the, the upper, upper income people, the middle income people, upper middle income people, they must be doing it. But mainly the lower middle income and the poorer communities, are they, do they know how to do this thing? And are they, meant, are they aware about how to do this thing? Have you done something at the at the MOH level or at the PHM level? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Sampata, for that uh, question. Uh, actually, even before the uh, crisis, uh, we have started uh, this cash management package. Uh, when I was at the estate and urban health unit because one of the root causes of the health outcomes that we see lie in cash management. So uh, what we have done is it's a collaborative uh, work with the Central Bank of Sri Lanka, Sun PF, and the ADIC. So all four, four partners with the Ministry of Health developed this package, and we have already uh, created uh, resource pools in the uh, nine provinces and all districts, the resource pools include uh, all stakeholders, health as well as non-health. And we have started awareness sessions as well as training of trainers for the uh, community level. So it's going on now. And we started it last uh, January. So since last January, it's happening. And in addition to that, with the crisis, uh, the, under the director, uh, DDG PHS2, that is the Deputy Director General of Public Health Services 2, uh, we have developed the emergency nutrition plan. So under 
the emergency nutrition plan, uh, there comes the cash transfers and then the micro uh, uh, support at the um, community level and also other nutritional supplementation. Cash management is one of the key pillars one of the uh, key uh, six pillars. So all that knowledge and awareness has been transferred to the primary health care as well as the public health staff. And from then, them we are planning to take it to the uh, community. In addition to that, we are taking the social media as well as mainstream media. I have been on media several times, and even today morning, I, have, I was involved in a training of trainers for the um, public health staff of CMC. So it's going on, and I hope that we will be able to continue it. Was I heard or shall I repeat yes, the question? Yes, please, please repeat the question. If someone wants help uh, on their family nutrition and diet planning, who should they approach? Is there a service other than going to a GP or consultant for a fee? Is there a community worker or clinic who can advise them for free? So nutrition and diet. There are two ways. One is the 24-7 uh, helpline of uh, Health Promotion Bureau. That is 9999. Uh, that is also called suicidal. So all doctors are trained on these aspects and they can t uh, get help. In addition to that, in, in the hospitals also, there are uh, nutrition specialists that they can go and uh, get support from. And in addition to that, the medical office of health because the emergency nutrition plan, as I mentioned, has been disseminated throughout the country. So they are well aware as to how to uh, support the people who are in need. Thank you. Uh, the second question, um, how can mentally disabled people get a proper job and how can they cope up at, in working places in Sri Lanka without any discrimination? It's difficult to find a job if uh, people disclose this disability uh, to their employers or society, but people cannot hide it because it is difficult. Any suggestions for mentally disabled people and the society? So, Pushpa, this question is for you. Yeah, thank you for that question. So, mentally disabled means, and uh, so any, uh, I mean, uh, if they are in the chronic mental illness, mental disabled means, and uh, if they have a bit of a low standard of working or functioning level, even then, every um, institution uh, and has a, it's a law, it's by law, 5% of their uh, employees should be uh, given this chance for these people. And it's been, uh, so they, the government provide uh, some sort of benefit for them. So because of that, so most of the um, factories and the big uh, institutions, uh, they like to employ people with disabilities. So mental disability also goes, goes under that. So the, because of that, there's a no problem on the, taking a job. And after that, uh, the other question is that uh, whether there are any other way, like I mean, so uh, we have a lot of uh, aware, awareness raising programs saying that mental disability, it's not a permanent thing for some people, and they just recover. And we are increasing the awareness of that. How to how to uh, be with these people, and they are not like I mean they can just function as normal people, just like I mean, mental illness sometimes, just like that you are having diabetes means that you are having a problem in controlling your sugar level, and if you are having a mental health problem means that you are have a problem with controlling your uh, brain chemicals. So and that is uh, it's not a big issue taking medication control if you can control your diabetes. And you can control your mental health issue as well. So there are, I mean, that is much better the mental health issue because not sometimes not long standing. Just to have to take treatment for about six months or maybe two years, so they are completely okay. So in that way, we are raising the awareness, 
and for whenever they want help and there are so many because legally they are protected and there should be a, no discrimination at work they should be allowed and if there anything that they can approach the mental health uh, specialist and uh, fight for their rights so we are always available for them and they can uh, contact the hotline so whatsoever it is so they have the same rights as uh, any other citizen in Sri Lanka. Thank you, Madam. Uh, we all have one more question, if time permits. Yes, just, just uh, the one brief, uh, very briefly. Thank you for the insightful presentations. The question is to the last two speakers. Could you explain a little more about the role of social workers in your setting and interventions? Uh, what and how do you think the uh, district secretariats and other uh, bottom level organizations and institutions should do to enhance their service? Well, uh, in the management plan, uh, rather apart from the pharmacological, psychological, we have a huge uh, area in managing the social issues. So, managing social issues, uh, the hospital sector medical institution per se can offer limited services. So of course you need to the community level. So in the community level, the, the local administrative officers, it would be the district secretarial to be the high top in the hierarchy and it would be the ground seva in the bottom in the hierarchy. So we have to get in hand along with all these people in laying first the safety shelter. Where will you send this person back to the same place or a different place? If it's the back to the same place, of course, you need to liaise with the local, the immediate people, the ground server as the administrator, or sometimes it's the neighbors or the close relatives. So in liaising part, our social worker in the multidisciplinary team will liaise with all the other stakeholders. At the same time, for example, if you can't keep the person at the place, we have to find a safe shelter. So for that, we have to sometimes call the social services department. They have certain areas of safe places. Or else the NGOs, the non-governmental organizations, where are they offer safety shelter. At the same time, sometimes there are legal issues or the document-wise issues in some of the cases. So of course, yes, we need to liaise with the local regional administration. At the same time, uh, the majority of the cases we handle will have significant financial or social adversities. So for those, we need not a cross-sectional, but a rather long-term or longitudinal assessment with care package. So for those, there will be financial assistance that is required or the educational in the legal system or the other services. Maybe what they need is protection, the security wise. So for those, of course, you have to liaise with the, the local administrative officers. So to start with the district secretariat, the Gram Sayer can the water. At the same time, the local police. We have to get together along with all these people in offering help. Thank you very much, Madam. Thank you uh, for those uh, uh, important questions, and I hope uh, for the, all the audience uh, over there, uh, we have answered uh, the, the questions adequately. And uh, considering the time factor, uh, we are, I think, uh, on time. Uh, we said uh, two to four. And uh, first of all, I would like to uh, give my um, heartiest, thankful gratitude to the speakers. Um, you all, all of you all, uh, did um, gave me the support and and the wonderful presentations. And uh, this is uh, for our country. Our country is in a crisis situation. As professionals, it is our duty to not only ask questions and raise our voices for problems. It is us who have to find the solution. So I hope as the um, Women's Committee, the, quest 
the, the problems we are having, we were able to give some solutions as well. So let us work together for the betterment of our country. Thank you. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. And on behalf of the Women's Health Committee of the Sri Lanka Medical Association, I thank the speakers once again. And thank you to everyone who joined us today in person and online. Have a pleasant day, everyone.